Okay, so without further ado, I'm going to hand over to our first speaker, that's Juliana. We're going to have about 15 minutes each for the three of us, then we'll have a general discussion and questions and answers at that point. We'll then break for coffee and then we'll have a few very short presentations from a few invited speakers before we go into a more general discussion, which is the, the bulk of the afternoon because we felt that's really important to get that conversation started. So over to our okay. first speaker, Juliana. Okay. Good <coughs> afternoon, everybody. I'm very pleased to, to be here. And I will start out giving you a little bit of background about myself. I uh, am presently a retired professor of applied linguistics at the University of Hamburg. When you're 65 and I'm over 65, you are thrown out of the German <laughs> university. So what did I do? I looked around and I'm now uh, the head of a PhD program at a small American university in Athens, Greece. And this also has to do with translation. People can actually have to do this a little bit as a, as a sort of propaganda talk. You can do this PhD, it's an Amer you get an American degree, the university is accredited in New Hampshire. I am um, probably best known for my model for translation quality assessment, which is actually my PhD. It goes back to 1976, I'm ashamed to say, but why should I be ashamed? I have uh, revised this model twice, once in 81 and again in 1997. It appeared in Germany, Gunther Nahr, and I'm now in the process of updating it, and so I'm very happy to be here and listen to people, not from research, but from um, the industry, profession clients, and so on. So this new book will appear with St. Jerome, hopefully sometime in the future, maybe in 19, uh, 2014. Anyway, so um, I don't want to bore you with details about the model. I just want to very briefly describe my take on translation. And this is, of course, relevant for, uh, for this model. I view translation <coughs> as recontextualization. So the notion of context, which is also re relevant for most of us here, is very important in, in my uh, interpretation of translation, which refers, of course, to the embeddedness of the original author, the translator, and the recipient in a particular context. Now, context is a very big uh, concept, very vague. So what one needs to do, and that's what I did, you have to break it down into some manageable units, which I call uh, contextual dimensions or parameters or whatever. And these parameters relate to the basic function that language uh, fulfills in life, namely, one, to import, info, to, to, to uh, portray information to inform about <coughs> certain states uh, of, of affairs. And this is related to the, what I call the function of field. It has to do with the subject matter, has to do with particular styles that uh, uh, represent this content with the specificity, terminology, and so on. And then uh, the second uh, function of language, as we all know, is related to the people using language, both the author, the stance the author has, and the recipient. So this is the interpersonal thing. And this is related to what is called a tenor, namely, again, the stance, the relationship between the author and the intended recipients. And the, the participation is uh, the uh, recipient somehow integrated in the text and so on. And the last type of context that's important is, do we have to do with uh, with oral language or written language, because it's, it's, this is different in terms of the styles. And also, an interesting in between, something in between oral and written. For instance, what I'm doing now is in between, because there's something written from which I extemporize. Okay? So translation is recontextualization, okay? uh, for me at least. And th if we g uh, start from the assumption that in translation, something like the function or the use of that something that is there originally, the source text, original text, whatever, is to be kept uh, up in the new text uh, emerging through the work of the translator. Then, um, and that's what I discovered a long time ago, many people have done this as well, in some cases it is not possible to maintain this function and you have to add other functions. And then I came up with a distinction between covert and overt translation, many different names by many different people. Uh, overt translation for me is, is a translation where the original basically has to be kept intact somehow. 
as much as possible because it travels through time and space and goes somewhere else, is transplanted into a new uh, culture. This, for instance, is the case with texts like, an, or, uh, like a speech, let's say the British Prime Minister, where you have to leave this intact. You can, of course, frame it differently, you can comment, and you can, but it is important to, to leave it as intact as possible. The covert translation is basically the opposite, where the function is kept up, but seeing that the the, the text travels to a very different lingua culture, it, it needs to be changed as much as possible in order to meet the expectations of the new addressee, in order to be um, amenable to the different communicative styles that, uh, that uh, are important for certain genres. In order to do this thing, I uh, came up with the notion of the cultural filter, which is basically a concept with which to capture what the translator has to do in order to make this new thing that he or she produces adaptable to the new context. It's just a, a, something like a, a piece of meta-language in order to come to grips what <coughs> actually needs to be done. Okay. So uh, an, an important point for my take on translation quality assessment is the, the difference between analysis <coughs> and evaluation. While a linguistic cultural analysis can be relatively objective, given certain criteria and what needs to be done in order to conduct this analysis, when it comes to evaluation, there's always a modicum of subjectivity. There's a difference between all sorts of social and personal factors impinge on evaluation. To say that evaluation, translation quality is something objective, I think, is, is uh, a bit uh, blind. Okay? So, now, I come to the uh, important topic for this uh, get-together. Academics, I, I'm an academic, and the industry of the profession, uh, are they so different? There's a gap, and um, why? Now, I would say there are different objectives, which doesn't mean that they can't be bridged somehow, but the ideas why people go about doing what they do is different. So for the industry, maybe you object to this because I'm not part of the industry, but this is what I think is being done, particularly having read uh, Joe's wonderful book. Here the idea is more encompassing. There's an <coughs> instrumental view of translation quality because it includes the translator and his or her competence and how to go about improving it to, such that we get more effective and better translation. It also has to do more with the process of translation, how it emerges in the work of the translator to make this more transparent, okay? And it make it more efficient en route to a maximally effective product. This is how I understand it. Maybe uh, you can object to this. Now, the academics, speaking uh, for myself, of course, have a main interest in fundamental research. And there's a quest for generalizations to abstract from the particulars of the actual path a translator embarks upon when he or she goes about translating. So this is basically coming up with notions like the cultural filter, remember, that I uh, presented to you, which is an abstraction, of course. Also, one is interested in different types of translations and their consequence for translation quality, be they covert, overt, or other translations that relate to certain different genres in different contexts. Okay? Now, the idea then for research or for the academics is to provide concepts and categories which we, with which we can talk about what we're doing when we're translating. So, there is, I mentioned this, the provision of a certain meta language in order to. Uh, um, uh, make us some kind of community of uh, translators and people talking about translation or researching it. The, uh, why are we going back to translation quality now? And the answer is simple because there's no res uh, new research emanating from the community, the community of academics and the community uh, uh, of the profession. Particularly if I look back at my own work, 1976, I told you a long time ago, also 1997 is a long time ago, corpus work has absolutely uh, uh, inundated us with everything. And I think corpus work is very important and adds a new dimension to previously, from my viewpoint, exemplar-based uh, work. Okay, So we have parallel corpus, comparable corpus, rich reference corpus and so on. So this, uh, this is new and it needs to be taken account in translation quality assessment. 
There is also an interesting strand of translation research that comes out of China, where I recently gave a couple of lectures, eco-translatology, which I thought is very interesting in that it also glorifies the notion of context. So what they do in eco-translatology is uh, to talk about and to do research on the relationship between the translators and the uh, original authors, the texts, and the whole environment, the eco-environment uh, uh, surrounding uh, these, uh, the, the texts and the production of the texts. So this, I think, is very interesting. Also, uh, there, there's interesting work by Sandra Halverson from Norway, who uh, relates bilingualism research and cognitive science and comes up with a conclusion that uh, I would like to also integrate in my uh, revision again about the, uh, the, uh, the centrality of the translator. And he or she should be in somehow integrated into these uh, models. For instance, something that I have not done in the past but will uh, want to do uh, later. There's also work by Mona Baker, many of you will know her, Manchester. She looks at translation as re-narration. This has nothing to do only with literary texts, but in general, she, she claims that narratives are useful units for analyzing, better than sentences or paragraphs or whatever, in particular in getting uh, to grips with political, commercial, and activist statements, right, Just to analyze the text. Um, the other important work is also comes out of Manchester. Luis Perez Gonzalez has in, done interesting work on the co-creational practices in media translation, where you cannot, where the, the lines between people producing a text and the com computer are basically blurred, and that I think should also be taken into account in um, in uh, models of uh, translation quality assessment. And again, I've talked about my, my own model, and I would like to somehow integrate all of these new strands into, into this uh, model to make it more adaptable to the present time. Okay. Now, what are the most important issues uh, to tackle in the future for all of us, or some of us? Remember the notion of cultural filter as, as, a, as an instrument for changing and adapting uh, the text to select something and to adapt it. Here we need, I think, um, extensive, contrastive, pragmatic research for this cultural filtering and for localization. In, uh, in other words, to know what different people in different countries with different languages in different genres, what do they expect? The norms are, of course, uh, dynamic and change, but still we need research over and above people's intuitions that this is the expectation norm. This is very, very important, and it needs to be a contrastive pragmatic. I've done a lot of work, but only on English and German over the past, past 40 years, and came up with generalizations, but there is a definite task with other language pairs, okay, to do this sort of thing. Also a necessity is to integrate the important translation process studies and experimental behavioral studies into translation quality assessment. There's a lot of work, and you all know it, but this needs to be somehow integrated into translation uh, evaluation. What is also important is the, and this hasn't been uh, done in terms of, of integrating it into translation quality assessment, is to examine the role of the one most important language in the world, and this is English, of course, as we all know, whether we like it or not. It's a dominant global lingua franca, and it has an inf influence on translation quality because many translators now who are non-native speakers of English now <coughs> translate into English or out of English, and this must be reflected uh, somehow. This is nothing to say against non-native speakers. I'm the last one. I'm, I'm a non-native speaker, <coughs> but still it should be uh, reflected uh, somehow. Research questions in a globalized and super diverse world, is it still useful to uphold the dichotomy between source language and target language? Isn't this sort of mixed question? Or increasingly <laughs> mixed. What is the impact of collaborative online translation on the notions of original or source text and target text or translation? Okay. What are and how can we measure the quality differences between volunteer and professional <coughs> translators? Or are we interested in this? Maybe we're not. I don't know. 
Are the labels non-professional and professional translators on the web valid and relevant? Maybe we should just ignore it. Okay. And what interests me in particular, because I've looked in many activists from my you know, political interests, what motivates online volunteer translators to engage in free labor? Why do they do it? I mean, is it a threat to us or not? If traditional translation quality assessment models, like my, my model, are judged to be outdated and no longer useful in, now, in our days in the online translation community, how can we go about measuring translation quality in this environment? It's probably the biggest uh, question of all. And again, coming back to the role of English, what is the qualitative impact of the rising numbers of non-native English speakers translating into and out of English? Maybe they're even better than native speakers. Who knows? OK, thank you very much. That's mm -hmm. it for me. <laughs> um, that said, I know I'm always a bit um, uncomfortable coming to Britain because I speak with this terrible American accent. I sometimes get the impression that people invite me because I talk about figures as in money. Oh. And that is so tacky in British English. Uh, I'm not going to address that issue right now, but I will talk about some of what I consider to be very important uh, points in this, in this discussion. found very interesting to uh, listen to you. Well, first thing first, I'm a translator. I translate probably 10 hours a day. I love it. I enjoy it. It's the best job in the world. The adrenaline rush, finding solutions to intellectual problems. Uh, I think that's a strength, actually. But the fact that I enjoy it sets me off from some categories of translators who are kind of cranky and rant. <laughs> um, writing is important to me. It's extremely important to me and my clients. I deal with extremely complex topics, financial communications, uh, corporate communications, and regulatory issues. Uh, a recent, in a recent case, uh, there was a bitter boardroom battle that led to my client uh, losing their company. Uh, so the cost of failure in what my clients do is extremely high. The cost of failure in what I do, if I produce a bad translation, is pretty high as well. I will lose my client, and I will not have any money, and I will not have a pension at the end. Um, I say that partly because, no, no, I say that partly because one of my problems in reading some of the academic research is that I find it quite difficult to untangle. I get the impression that people are sometimes writing in an echo chamber, writing for other experts who will then comment on yet another detailed definition of this and that. I know that's how it works there, but I just, just to make it clear, my writing has to be compelling. And when I talk about what I do to the press, for example, about what translation is, and that for me is important as well, it has to be compelling. I can't go out of my way to make it complicated. Making things clear does not mean that you're stupid or that you're dumbing things down. Making things clear can be a lot harder than using jargon. Uh, that's an opinion, right? Now, also, I'm speaking for myself. Uh, I have served, had offices in, in professional associations and so on, and now I'm out of that a bit, uh, so I'm speaking only for myself, and when I will say some more controversial things, I will quote somebody else just so I don't get anything <laughs> thrown at me. Uh, my first reaction to this discussion, which I think is very interesting, is uh, there's a gap between theory and practice. What gap is that? Let me think about this. Actually, I wonder if it's not just, not, not necessarily a gap, but just the fact that the practitioners, professional translators, are tackling the issues you're talking about at a much, much higher level, all right, in terms of what we deliver to our clients, okay? I understand that the role of, of theory people is to define things down, down to the ground, and that's very, very important if you're going to build a theory up on something. But a lot of what you seem to be, not you, Juliana, but I, I, any, no, uh, take, take uh, seem, no, seem to be <laughs> defining are things that are so obvious that I get the impression that they're kind of built into my behavior as a professional translator, which means if I stop to look too closely at what you're doing, I say, my gosh, you know, duh, is, is a kind of uh, <laughs> response to that, which is not, not to criticize what you're doing, but just to say we're doing something different. I represent uh, here, actually, um, a certain segment of the market. I think we all agree that there's not one translation market, there are 
hundreds of segments. And the one I represent is the high-end premium market. I'm not a big-headed person, but I have worked very hard to, to get accumulate expertise in the field where I work, and so I, I sell what I do for quite a high price to people who take it extremely seriously. One problem I have with a lot of the work on translation metrics in particular, but also lots of the assessment uh, models, is that they are dealing very clearly with the commodity end of the market. So they don't cover what I do. Right? Um, now I can squawk over in my corner and say, look at me, look at me, look at me. And some of the metrics people will say, well, come on over here, tell us what you're doing. Right? In fact, most of the time, I simply don't have time for that. Right? And uh, that perhaps is my fault and the fault of professional translators working at the high end of the market. But I think it becomes a problem for you, too, if you're basing your analyses on the commodity end of the market. Um, I am aware of various quality assessment models. There's the workflow one, workflow one, which is sort of interesting. It doesn't measure quality per se, but it does attempt to create more rational workflows so that work can be better when it comes out the other end. Uh, the metrics, as I said, I, I, I see that as something which really does not apply to a lot of what uh, top end translators do. Um, <coughs> More recently, of course, there have been attempts to use the metrics to measure the quality of, of text produced by machine or by, with, with or without post-editing, even post-editing. And that, I think, is interesting, but again, it just doesn't, doesn't apply to what I do. Now, in, speak, in preparing for this, I did speak to a bunch of um, fellow high-end professionals, right? And one of them tried to explain how he saw the problem as being a question of, say, with an analogy in the in the aircraft field. Uh, for him, and I will cite this, uh, the theory people are writing treatises on the theory of aircraft flight and the practical aspects of implementation on the most basic levels, the aerodynamics of constructing an airfoil, the instabilities of airflow, the ability of novices to flap their own wings and fly for a few hundred feet before they hit the sand dune, whereas we, we, uh, professionals, are actually selling first class seats in a plane that is the commercial section of a plane that's flying at 35,000 feet. Does that sound arrogant of me? I really see it that way, in fact. I'm maybe not in the first class, I'm in the economy section. <laughs> but, but still, we're working at a completely different level, all right? The, the, the givens for us are much, much higher than what you're dealing in. Um, so, we agree on that, I think, right? Yeah. Uh, in, in past pre um, presentations, I have made a point of talking about this difference between the commodity end of the market, the bulk market, and the premium end. And I think, I really think, that has to be taken into account if you're going to have anything that will be particularly useful for me in the area that I work in. Uh, just an anecdotal point, I worked on the Optimal program, the European Commission's Optimal program, which is an excellent program for training tra uh, trainers of translators. And in, in chatting with the extremely motivated people I saw there, very good people, uh, I got the impression that many of them had struggled to make it as freelance translators before getting into their academic programs and getting on tenure track to work in universities. In other words, my impression was that a lot of them really were not working at the high end of the transla translation market when they were out there, which meant getting tenure, working in a university, was kind of a relief for them. And that, again, would mean that if you are working with that, that starting point, um, it seems to me that, that you are occluding, again, an entire section of the market. And I just wanted to mention that in passing. Um, for me, writing is important. Subject matter specialization is absolutely essential. And I spend a lot of my time digging deep, deep, deep down into my subject specialties in such a way that I can speak with my clients in the corporate world, uh, I could pass a Turing test. If I'm in a meeting with them for 10 minutes, they will think I am an international banker, or they will think that I am a regulatory authority or something like that. That is part of the skills that I bring to, bring to the job. And again, I get the impression very often from, from research uh, that researchers don't understand that. And it, it could be, and this is again, I'm just speculating, one of the re reasons perhaps that you're interested or people, there seems to be such interest in crowdsourcing, right? Is that that's, that happens at a much lower level, so it's easier for researchers to get into, right? If you're going to start analyzing what top-end professionals do, 
you've got to invest an awful lot of time in laser optics or nuclear physics or regulatory issues and stock exchanges. And it gets, I think, very tiring very quickly. Uh, I did want to show you an example. Just to prove, this is to prove that I am aware that there are different levels of quality. And also I think, you know, examples may be silly, but they do anchor the discussion a bit. Uh, this, is a, this is a translation, and I, I've occasionally spoken to students and asked them, you know, I do a little quiz, 10 texts. Is this a good translation or not? Do you think the client was happy? Now, if you're a native English speaker, you'll look at that and say, hmm, 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 odd. The client, Siemens, was delighted. Because this, was, this is actually totally machine translated, Right? Mm -hmm. on, a, on a proprietary system developed by Terence Lewis. And the whole point was that Siemens runs <coughs> millions of words through this system to identify calls for tenders that they might want to respond to. There's no way on earth a, a human being could do this or would want to do this. And this generates, this type of translation generates the information Siemens needs to know if they want to take the time and, and energy to actually invest in that. Okay, here's another example. This is something that actually was uh, submitted to me. Again, I ask stu students or academics, do you think, is this a good translation? And the interesting thing for me here, and it comes back to what you said, Juliana, is that non-native speakers of English who are kind of wowed by the apparently technical nature of this mm -hmm. say, hmm, that's pretty good, that's pretty good. And it's true, if you look at it, there aren't any grammatical mistakes in there. This text was refused by a client. I did not do this text, right? I was being contacted <laughs> to redo it. The point was, this, this, this was a financial group that was looking to raise 70 million uh, euros uh, through, through a, a prospectus that they had out there. And they commissioned this translation. And you, if you know French, you can see the syntax is pretty much the same and so on. Right. The client's response was, this is hopeless. We are competing with other projects like this, no, none of our potential investors are going to read past page one, right? Mm -hmm. Because the style is not good, all right? And that, of course, is music to my ears and change in my, my pocketbook because that is exactly what I do. I know what they're talking about and I fix it up. And here again, an interesting point is, in my field, it is a given that I improve texts. The, the idea of, of producing equal errors would be just nonsensical. It wouldn't make any, my, my point here is that I am helping my clients look as, as good as I can, right? And I do it, of course, discussing it with them. I write better than my clients. That should be no surprise. They're financial people. They're really good at what they do, but they do not write as well as I do. And my, my expertise in writing is what sets me apart. And of course, if you're teaching students, I think you really want to emphasize that with your students. Um, okay, here's a, maybe a controversial one. This is, I'm quoting somebody else here, you will notice. Uh, but it comes back to my argument about bulk versus premium. And I would maintain that a lot of what is being sold as commercial translation out there is certainly not premium, but it's probably good enough for, the, for what people want. One problem I see, however, is that providers of commodity translation, seeing the prices that are charged in my sector, get greedy and they want to get in there, but they do not have the investment in, not just terminology, Term terminology is the easy part. They don't invest in the subject matter knowledge and the writing skills and they certainly don't pay their translators enough so the translators can actually do it properly. And that I think is an issue that we should probably discuss today. Um, here's a quote from a client. Now that's interesting too. That's a real life client actually. And, uh, okay, I mean, I'll, I'll give you these PowerPoints afterwards if you like, but I, and I can give you a ton of other examples should you, should you be interested, and should you not deem it too trivial, right? <coughs> but here again, interesting, this is a specialist client who actually wants good writing. Here's a bigger client, actually not necessarily a bigger client, but I thought this was interesting because it's an institution, French Minister of Finance. Um, they buy in translations. They, they, don't, they could care less about ISO and the, and the metrics and so on and so forth. They want to know who's doing the job. They want to be sure the person knows the field in depth, in depth. And uh, they, they want to be able to contact them personally. And I think that's sort of an interesting comment on where at least part of the market is. And here I just, uh, I'm actually, do I have a two, five more minutes? It's okay? Okay. Um, this is just a thought that occurred, all right? Uh, and I say this as a person who is specialized in highly technical financial documents. I'm going to argue to you the role of poetry 
right? The role of the way poetry impacts the reader is moves them in a certain way. And if translation is a communicative act, the readers of my fund prospectus or the readers of any of the texts that I'm working on that are supposed to convince someone of someone have to move my reader in the same way. They have to hook them and keep them reading to the end, but they also have to build the kind of trust you get when you read the text and it speaks to you. And that applies not just in literary translation or poetry, it applies in technical translation, yes. financial translation, medical, legal, and so on Absolutely. down the line. Yeah. And that is also why I'm a little bit skeptical of applying metrics that can be useful for low-end translation to the entire field. Um, I did want to say that, in my opinion, uh, although I do not read a lot of research, I will admit that, and I haven't done any research except twice over a 10-year period, I bought in six examples of translations from translation providers in my field just to see what a good client would get if they had the budget to put in it. And not. The first time, the, the results were dire. They were just awful, in fact. The second time, since specialized translation has really picked up some steam now, of the six texts I bought, two of them were quite good. They were produced by specialized freelance translators, in one case working with a reviser provided by an agency. And that's kind of interesting to see that there's progress there. Um, I would say, too, that there are some research projects I've seen where, again, you know, it's not my field, research is not my field, but I, I hear the echo chamber effect of researchers talking to themselves, pretending to talk about the commercial market or the real, the real translation market, or one segment of it, but not really, really connecting uh, with anything that I would consider worth working on. Uh, in this respect, I would like to just comment on a few projects. Uh, you will be familiar with this, and I think when you are, this is a personal opinion, huh? When you're working on translation research projects that you'd like to work on, uh, it's, for me it's very important that you consider not doing any harm first way around. Um, I've been struck in your book, Joe, which is an excellent book, excellent book, uh, but also in a lot of the stuff you read about the translation industry in the press and among researchers by the fact that the, that the information about the translation industry is based on incomplete, flawed data. Common Sense Advisory is the only act in town, so people refer to the, documents, to the statistics they produce as reliable. They are not. They are not, and we can get into this in detail uh, later if you like. There is, there's a self-selecting bias, uh, which means that they are really not to be trusted. Uh, and there's an impact on that, uh, of that on translator, translation professionals like myself. This is just an article that was in CNN, and it's kind of nice because it's talking about translation being a hot job skill. It's good to hear. Um, it was nice and I enjoyed it until I got to the end where we have some information from Common Sense Advisory, um, which is giving us a 13 cent a word price. Uh, all right, for the commodity end of the market perhaps, but it is not, it is not the price that is charged at the top end of the market. Uh, we're talking about something like three or four times that. And if you do not know that and you are teaching students, seems to me you may well be teaching them to aim far too low. Um, I also want to put in a word here against academic driven research projects that pretend to be industry driven. Again, we can talk about this later if you like. Transert uh, is one such project. I have great <laughs> respect for the European Commission and the DGT is a wonderful, wonderful outfit. I worked on some of their projects most recently, Optimale. <laughs> um, but I have followed the Transert boondoggle from the beginning and assure you that it has very little, if anything, to do with professional translators. The professional associations who are on board are there solely to make sure it doesn't get any worse than it was at the beginning. There's a group of academics who have an interesting point of view, academic point of view, and who are pretending that it is industry driven. It is not. Uh, well, I'm up here ranting away, and I did want to end with something kind of positive. Here's some things that I would like to see. Uh, I think what we really are lacking in the professional area is serious, reliable data on the structure of the translation market, the economics of the translation market. Because translators, as you know, are literate but not numerate most of the time, which is a pity because they don't know how to, how to pitch themselves, they don't know how to negotiate. Um, I do think that researchers are more likely to be a bit more numerate, so I plea to you, it would be very, very handy if someone could get going on this. 
Um, I'm also really interested in research that makes me a better translator. Again, I hope I'm not lowering the tone of the conversation here, but this is, this is really quite important to me. And I wanted to give you an example. Um, Dave Gemelli is here from BCV Banque Cantonale Vaudoise in Switzerland, and he's worked with some students from ETI, AT in Geneva, uh, producing corpora research, which is extremely useful yes. to those of us working in the area of financial translation. They've analyzed uh, translated versions of annual reports, right, from French to English, against annual reports written directly in English, mm -hmm. in fact, mm -hmm. and done some research on the vocabulary that's used and not, and what comes out of the translations, which is not in the real things. And those are hints, pointers, immensely useful for those of us who are perhaps too sunk into our specialty to recognize that. Here's one example, and again, I'm taking too much time, sorry about this, uh, but the, the very idea that at French annual report, okay, it's a, it's a high-end product, uh, annual reports, they cost 15,000 to 35,000 euros a piece, for example, and a lot of that goes for translation. In fact. Um, here, uh, research by Rosie Wells, working under Dave, uh, pointed out that in translations of French annual reports, often translators were using the third person because they do it like that in French, and they weren't aware enough, they just hadn't, hadn't occurred to them that in English language annual reports you use the first person, of course. And that's just incredibly useful. It sounds, it sounds very small, but it's, it, that sort of thing is useful. Same thing, the, Rosie's research um, revealed that words that were underutilized in the translations, words that I can, I, I can get that information and use it the very next day, the very next afternoon in a text I'm translating, that's handy. Same thing, here's just another example, drive is very underused uh, in translations and decided is overused because the French keep <coughs> saying uh, décider de faire quelque chose when in fact they did it. They didn't decide to do it. And <laughs> translators who are not aware of that will make mistakes. Research can be very, very helpful in making translators better if it is grounded in this way. Um, this X, I'm gonna go through, actually this was just collocations and it's too long so I'm gonna go through and we can talk about it later if you like. The, the gist of it was that these Fa uh, phrases found, collocations found in certain translations were direct calque from the French and should not be used. Got it. Um, I'm also interested, and this is the last point, in research that helps students move into professional life more easily. Um, I have, I take interns in fact, and I've been, I always ask them to see what, what, if they can show me something they've done during their courses. Uh, I'm very often astonished by how laxly they are graded. Uh, they, and I'm not saying, I know for pedagogical reasons you can't knock them down completely, right? You have to encourage them. At the same time, there is such a gap between how they're being graded in most institutions and what a real professional would require that I would really, really like to see some uh, more research undertaken to compare this. I would think for academics it would be useful to see to how you could change your teaching perhaps to accommodate that. Uh, I've made this point several times at European meetings and it has been met with a deafening silence. <laughs> and that's all I have to say. Thank you very much.